We're joined by a man, I would say, who needs no introduction, but you're going to get one anyways. Welcome, John Rao. Four players in our Barstool Sports, brought to you by our very good friends at Chevy Chevrolet. Uh, big show. I would say monumental show in the history of the Four Play podcast. Uh, we're here live from Greyhawk Golf Club in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, we're joined, it's myself, Frankie Trent. We're joined by a man, I would say, who needs no introduction, but you're going to get one anyways. He is currently the number three ranked player in the world, although he is breathing down the neck of number one ranked player in the world and his boy, his European Ryder Cup uh, teammate and fellow Stallworth Rory McIlroy. He's an 18 time professional winner, nine times on the PGA Tour, nine times uh, worldwide. From Spain, he's got a uh, beautiful wife, Kelly. He's got two beautiful sons with fantastic Spanish names that I'm probably going to mess up, but I believe it's Capa and Aneco. Yeah, it was good. Wow. It's very close. How good are those names, by the way? Uh, he's the United States Open Champion 2021 at Torrey Pines, where he also won his first PGA Tour event in 2017, which was one week before we launched the Four Play Podcast. Now we've come full circle, and you're here. Welcome, John Rao. It's great to be here. Wow, what an uh, intro. You also... I'm, 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 I'm honored. God. <laughs> You also, I don't know if you know this, you share a uh, sports psychologist with Frankie Burley right well, here. Yeah, I was going to say we're teammates or we're patients, which, whichever way you want to look at it. But Dr. Brett McCabe, is, uh, I'm, I'm under his wing right now, and he's kind of he's just good. trying to get me dialed in. He's good. I actually don't talk with him so much about golf. Um, one of his specialties is family relationships, so wow. a lot of it. He's almost more of a marriage counselor than anything else. Holy shit. So he helps with Kelly and I and, and family dynamics. Because that's an important thing, right? I mean, for sure, things in in a family. Um, once you turn pro, because Kelly was with me throughout the process, can can get complicated. So that's amazing. That's really interesting because you hear that a lot with uh, with athletes mm-hmm. with getting married. There's a stereotype like once you get married, it'll play as well. Uh, no, you've got no, no, two God, young no. kids now. I mean, yeah, God, how no. how how difficult is that to balance everything, or does it help? <laughs> Probably helps. Well, we listen. We hire the help. Luckily, we can afford it. Yeah, but it's just this week. One of them had the week off, and we gave Monday and Tuesday off to, to the other one. So we've been a little busier. Uh, you can hear my voice. I've been sick. Both the kids have been sick, so it's been a little bit busier. But it's part of being a parent. I mean, I'm, the only, I'm not the only one. There's millions of people that have actual jobs that have a bit more of a struggle and have to take care of kids. So for me, it's more on Kelly. In this, in this type of line of work where golf takes up so much time, um, it's a lot on the wife. Right? It's uh, It's... It's up to her to pick up a lot of this luck, and I got very lucky and very blessed in that sense. I also want to note that you showed up by yourself. I, we weren't sure if some golfers show up with a big entourage. You just showed up, John Rum, by yourself. I'm impressed by that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes my manager will be here, but if, if I, I don't like walking around with a crowd. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, growing up in Spain, and I was one of the, the only person in my class that played golf. I got, got used to being alone on the golf course and doing stuff like that, so... I don't need somebody with me all day. If I was somebody was coming with me, it's because they would be doing the interview. Otherwise, I mean, I can take it on myself. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not that big a deal. I'm just a golfer. Well, Where's John fucking around. Yeah, man? I'm not. I'm a big deal on a golf course. I can walk down the street anywhere except my hometown, and I'm perfectly fine. I, I really. I'm not. No, God, That's not interesting even close. to me. Not even close. You're so recognizable. Like, well, it I'm, could also be because on TV they make it sound like I'm the angriest person on the planet. Well, we got to get into that a little so, bit. So maybe people think I'm always angry and I might bite your head off, but that's not true. I think we jump right into that. I mean, that's been a topic of discussion on our show. And I wondered for all these years, you know, we, we, you know, we make jokes and every time we see yeah. something, we'll, uh, I'm a head case myself. So I always really, so, I would say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a be honest. I don't want to cut you off, but <laughs> I would like to see the honesty between everybody that plays golf. How many of you are, judging me and then you're actually losing your head on the golf course too 100 percent. yes like 100 percent. you so, just see my stuff so here we go camera. so a lot of the right. things we see you do i actually we find funny we're like this guy he blows up and then there's a moment and you can we all we, we said it's almost like defusing a bomb like he's trying to do it and then all of a sudden it explodes <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like it's how like, do you feel about so that example you can, <laughs> you, can, you can see you're trying to defuse this thing and it's just going to explode in two seconds but what I always say is golf golfers get kind of fucked in the sense that like in baseball, if I if I'm if I'm up and I pop up to the pitcher and I and I stranded three runners on base, I'm allowed to take my bat and throw it on the ground or I go into the dugout and I take my helmet and I toss it yeah. down and no one says a word. They in actually hockey, like it. In hockey you can literally fight someone out of aggression. In football you can like push a guy and be like, Fuck you. But in golf, if you say like, damn it, they're like, Whoa. 
Whoa. So he's mad right now. In every other sport is passion. Right. And golf is an issue. I don't know why. You have that passion. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I spend a lot of time doing what I do as, as everybody on the PGA Tour. Mm. We're all going to have different reactions. And yes, sometimes I wish it was a little different to what I do. Sometimes it gets a little bit out of control. But for the most part, it's, it's what I need to do. Does it you can't you? imagine how many times it's helped. You're right. Like how many times? I made bogey on Maui on the first hole. I'm walking to the next tee. You can't see me or hear me, but I'm losing my freaking mind. Follow on to make 11 birdies or nine birdies in an eagle to win a tournament. Unfortunately, and, and a mental coach, the national coach and mental coach in Spain told me many times, the reason it's been so hard for me to change is because it helps me so much. Yeah. There's some situation where it yeah. doesn't, but for my whole career, it's helped me play better. Right, I think Brendan so, Cabus said, like, don't change who a person is. Try to channel it in a way that it's going to help you. And I think you've done that almost better than anybody. So the main thing that annoys me, I don't mind getting mad at myself, is when I start deflecting and I get mad at things outside myself. That's when I get, and it comes a whiny. That's what I don't like. And that's what I want to change, and that's what I'm working on changing. You talk to anybody from junior golf to college to now, there is an improvement. It's just there's been times when I go to the golf course and I say, I'm not going to get mad today, and I don't get mad, and I shoot 72. And I'm like, Shouldn't what happened? Mad. And I'm like, I, you know, it, it helps me. So there's a way between this, this, this a thin line, and that's what I'm working on. I want to, I want to keep getting mad because everybody does, right? It's just how it's portrayed that sometimes I don't like. And I, I can pinpoint every time in my career that I haven't liked. It's just... And there's a little bit of it to work. It's a work in progress. That's you're a fire. You can't put water on the fire when you're in the heat right. of it. Right. Well, and then you see me in the Ryder Cup and it's always oh, great TV. You see my finish at the US Open and the fist bumps and it's great TV. I mean, it's, it's you can't have one a, without the other. There's honestly. gonna be a balance. Yeah. There's gonna be a balance, right? Yeah, and I think uh as a as a viewer, right? Like when we've talked about it, we like Frank said, we try to make people laugh. That's what we do. So obviously we see that we're gonna go crazy. But it's, it's great TV, it's great for the sport. It's you're infinitely more entertaining and intriguing to watch than most players because of that. Well, thank you. I <laughs> True. Uh, yeah. I mean, listen, I'm not. That's one of the complaints I hear about golf, that people are like robots. Totally. You're not going to get that from me. The most robot-like you'll see me was at Palm Springs, and I got mad my fair share of times. You might see it or not, but it's it's there, right? That Sunday in Palm Springs was about as even as I probably would have been. But for the oh. most part, you'll see me fist bump, and you'll see me. There's always going to be some kind of reaction. Yeah. I, uh, the Palm Springs, so that, you know, an incident like that's interesting where, you know, you made the comments about the putting contest, you get upset. <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> I had, I, I need a redemption to say that. That was just funny. When you see, which is great. I like that you did the callback. When you, when something like that happens, like it did last year, and then you find out afterwards that those comments were caught, like, what's your reaction to that? Do you care? Whatever. I mean, it was, I remember to a 17 at Nicholas, there was like three people on the green. I'm like, come on. <laughs> the odds of that happen. Now, of all the things I've said with thousands of people watching, this gets caught like that. Yeah. Uh, but the truth is, I, I mean, I was mainly making an argument to the fact that I was playing so bad, I had no business being on the top 15. No business. Like, there, there wasn't, that year, there was zero penalty for missing the fairway. Yeah. None whatsoever. So, and it's actually courses that I like, right? It's, it's, it's something that I like. It's a tournament that I like. And I've won twice there. Obviously, I like it. But it's just, uh, it's just funny that that was, that was just the timing. Yeah. What kind of setups do you like? What do you, do you, you know, do you have? Anything, anything. I, I, obviously, Tor is one of my favorites. I like it when it's a little tougher out there and you got to go out there and perform, right? I like it. Uh, Palm Springs, you still have to go out there and make birdies. That's kind of what it is. You play three different courses. That makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, I wish we could see more rough, but the time of year makes it difficult. I mean, you would have six feet of rough and then dormant rough. Bermuda, right. which makes it, it's almost like far away. Um, but setups like Memorial, Tory, where, you know, 10 to 15 under is going to win. And if you shoot 15 under, you're winning by a margin. Uh, those tough ones where a 69 is a heck of a round, that's what I like. Do you go into a tournament with a number usually? No, God, no. I've been, we've been so wrong lately. <laughs> like I've heard Jack Nicholas had an innate ability to predict the score. Who would have guessed Whistling Straits 20 under was going to win? Yeah, right. And then I saw the golf course and I said, how the hell they shoot 20 under here? Right. Right. Who would have guessed? I wouldn't have guessed that Southern Hills would six under, five under went into the playoff. I think it was five. Without one, without wind, I would have thought it was higher than that. It would have been higher. Yeah. So it, I can't really tell you the score. It's, 
I, maybe before Sunday, like on Saturday night, I can g- have a pretty good guess, but not before the week. They you, they can change it too much nowadays. Do you change your strategy or approach much based on what the scoring's doing, or do you? Uh, how deep in the course management and strategy are you? No, it depends. You, you have to get in there. I mean, if it's if birdies are hard to come by, you have to pick and choose when you can be aggressive, right? That's that's the main aspect of things. Uh, but not really. I don't I don't stray too much for from what I feel like is my my playing style. Uh, your lines might change a little bit, right? So you can always make aggressive swings into more conservative lines. That would be the easiest way to put it. So if we take Torrey Pines for example put it on the fairway on one you're not always going to rifle at a back right pin because it's not the easiest so you might you know your landing spots might change a bit to give yourself chances but uh for the most part i'm pretty much at the pin for the most part of the tournament sundays it might change a bit from bolt to blazer which i love the blazers and the bolts equinox to silverado what am I talking about right now, Trent Eddie? Chevrolet. Chevy EVs, which are for everyone, everywhere, electric vehicles. These guys have power stations popping up all around this country. You don't, you don't have to worry about them. Gas prices. That's right. You don't they, have to worry about fueling up. It's only 47 years left of gas. Yeah, we're running. Yeah, we're almost done. We're getting to the bottom of the barrel, literally. Um, yeah. It's just important, and you want to be ahead of the game. At this point, you want to be one step ahead. You don't want it to be panic time That's where everyone's one. rushing to get EVs. You want to make sure that you're in it early. Um, Chevy is a leader in this space, and they've figured out a way to make these the best cars possible while running on EVs. And they've got over 2,000 certified EV dealerships. Our good friends at Chevy, Chevrolet, the bow tie right on the grill there. It's beautiful. You know it. it's classic, yet they're coming into the modern age. Ha! With the EVs for everyone everywhere, they got the established full line brand over at Chevrolet. Like I mentioned, you can check out the Equinox EV, the Blazer EV, the Silverado EV. Uh, they're powered by Ultium for an all electric future. You could get the Bolt EV and the Bolt EUV right now. So go to Chevrolet's website, build them out, mess around a little bit, change the colors, the interior, realize that you could pre order and order some Chevy EVs, Chevrolet EVs for everyone everywhere. So this last week we saw Max Homa, obviously one played well, but he did a, a mid-round interview with a. I've been asked to do this next week, so I mean I haven't seen it. Are we so going to see John Rahm in a in mid-round interview? Did he hit the shot with the yeah. with the earpiece? He had on? the one in, yeah. See, that's what I don't know if I'm going to do. Yeah, that seemed. I was shocked when I saw that. Yeah. But you're open to hitting the shot, put it in, and then do it. I can hit the tee shot, put it on. What I don't know, obviously, Dude, the one if I you like miss the green, you're like that fire comes up and you're on national. Well, they that's what they want. They I, know. Like, I know. They want to. They want to catch purpose. the caddy interaction too, right? Like I don't want to <laughs> yeah. be like on and off. So they did ask me to do it on 16 here, oh. which okay. would be a little bit easier. But yeah, like, I don't know. I'm you know, it would be hard to be thinking about the shot and explaining all those things. And do you like that atmosphere, 16? Love it. Okay, love it. What did how Max did it on 13? Didn't he? Last he week? did it on 13. Yeah. How did he do on the hole? He hit a great drive. Then he hit it, what, into like a greenside bunker or yeah, something? Yeah. And did he get up and down? I'm not sure if he got up and down. But the clip that was on uh, Twitter, he he hit the shot, tee shot, pretty much exactly how he was describing. And then walking up to the second shot, he he talked a lot through like, you know, obviously this next shot is a big one. you got to be really smart based on where the pin is because if you fan one and you end up in one of those bunkers that's on 13, that's the third that bunker down or whatever. Friday then, right? So or, yeah, I think Friday. it was Friday. You know, you have a hard shot. So he's talking through it, and it was it was amazing because they had Trevor and they had a couple different guys like Pepper him with questions and all that going on, and then he hit the shot. But they had him and Joe talking through the yeah, shot. So yeah, yeah. A so, lot of breath, too, walking up the field. Yeah, he's like panting. <laughs> walking up the fucking field. It's a walk. It's it like, oh, if you put a mic on me, I'd be breathing <laughs> into that thing. Honestly, people don't realize because that, that after the T-shirt, you go like, yeah, 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 and you're walking all around. Like, and you're trying to talk and walk. I get, I, I get it. I, I mean, I would be, too. Uh, I don't know, you know, like... I don't know how much I want to talk about the shot. Yeah. While I'm playing a tournament, I'm okay. Like European too, that's a great. We do mid round interviews. I'm okay with that. I've told them a million times I would do it, but I don't know how okay I am with having a birdie putt or a par putt on that crazy environment with an earphone. I, like I right. just don't know. And what you just mentioned, I don't know if I have the self awareness if I hit a best shot to not say <laughs> what I can't say. 
So I don't know. So good. Even better. Yeah, like I don't want it to affect my score. Yeah. Like, we're going to go down to John. Okay, we're going to go back to the booth here. <laughs> please, one long. <laughs> please, 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 please. Maybe even like, I don't, I don't want it to I affect. I think it's a national emergency. <laughs> like I'll be okay on 17, for example, if I hit the T shot, then put it on and, and start talking. Yeah. Up yeah. until I get to the green. See. I'll be okay with that. It's a good couple so minutes. So compromise with them. Yeah, yeah, and then on the green, I take it off, give it to them, and I finish. Yeah. I don't know if I want to have it on the entire time. Yeah. Where did this uh, fire start? Obviously, in Spain, did you play the contact sports? Were you a multi-sport <laughs> athlete? Like, what? where did this all start? No, I, I, I played every sport I could growing up. And so younger brother, I think, almost every younger sibling is more competitive than the oldest. Yeah. yeah. Um, I could be wrong, as is my case. My dad's very competitive. My brother's very competitive. My grandpa was very comp- competitive. So we're all the same. Hate to lose. Uh, we always laughed. If we teed off as a family, we rarely, all of us, would finish. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me, guys, yeah. just so you know. Yeah. It's, it's not just me. So <laughs> It's probably not helping the Spanish stereotype either. It's amazing. Uh, I think a lot of families can relate to that. For sure. Yeah, definitely. But I, I grew up playing a lot of sports, and I've always hated to lose. Hated to lose. I just don't like it. And love to win, obviously. So um, it's something I was born with. I, I couldn't tell you. And I think my parents recognized that and, and fed into the competitiveness of a child. So I grew up playing golf, obviously. I uh, was a goalkeeper in soccer. I did uh, the Olympic canoeing, K1 canoeing. Wow. If you, um, sorry, K2. K2 canoeing. Uh, K1, I think it is. It's the one where, you know, they're... Is not you're not rolling backwards. Yeah. Uh, those are hard. Those are hard. Kind of like kayaking, but they're yeah. zooming. I mean, I did that for a few years. Uh, sport here known as high ally. For people that know what high ally is, you can look it up. Isn't uh, that like it, it could be like the most um, like fastest ball in sports? Yeah, the fastest ball. But then imagine also, a massive squash court yeah, I've with seen a this before. baseball ball that is harder and bounces more than baseball, and they have this like basket looking like a hook. Okay. And then basically catching and sling it. So I played that with a wooden paddle. That game's crazy. So you have to wear a helmet. Yeah. Because you can, wow. there's two people on the back, two people on the front. It's easily 30 yards long. So the people on the front, you can get smoked. Yeah. I've hit somebody. I've been hit. <laughs> um, so you have no other padding, by the way. If you get hit on the spine or on the back or the wrist, you feel it. And yeah, you play with a, with a wooden paddle. I grew up playing that as well. Another variant would you play with a racket and more like a rubber ball. No helmet, but if you get hit, that stinks for a while. Uh, so if you see the sport and you see my swing, you'd actually realize, okay, that makes a lot of freaking sense. Oh, no way. Yeah, if you if you pulled up an image, you would see. And then um, I did a little bit of kung fu and martial arts growing up because I liked it. Uh, even as a few years as a pro my early on. You'd be a fierce I did some taekwondo like as well. Uh, I just like it. I like the whole, what they stand for, right? I think my, I'm going to try to have my kids do it as well. Really? Yeah. Uh, it's it's more of learning to be able to defend yourself mm-hmm. and knowing when to do it. Yeah, uh, it's just just having certain physical ability. I had one time playing golf with my brother, just the two of us. I made a big putt on eighteen to force a playoff against them, and he grabbed it out of the hole and threw it in the water. And I refused to play the playoff unless he went and got my ball out of the water. <laughs> and then we had to just drive home together in silence. <laughs> So I get it. <laughs> the simplest yeah. stuff. See, my brother's six years older, so I couldn't beat him for a long time. So, yeah. Uh, uh, I think he stopped playing golf before I could beat him. He was, he was a soccer player. So I don't know. Um, me, we didn't have anything like that. Yeah. My dad definitely got competitive. You getting I, into the, uh, the pickleball rage at all? I've played. Yeah. I just, I have, I have a space for a pickleball. I actually have the lines for the pickleball court in the basketball area at the house, but, I just don't, like, I don't, I feel like it's an unnecessary way of possibly getting hurt. Yeah, there's a lot. I feel like there's a good amount of knee injuries. I've had too many people tell me, and I'm big enough to reach quite a bit. But And I also love to play with people on my own level. Yeah. I've gone to play with people that play way too much, and they're good, and it's no fun. We played against Larry. <laughs> no fun. I told them, I'm week. like, if you want to play against me with no strokes, that would be like what I'm feeling right now. <laughs> right. Like, I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm sweating as much as I can. I'm tired. And I'm basically getting skunked every single time. Like, this is not fun. We played so, with Larry Fitzgerald, and he made me want to quit sports forever. It was, well, yeah, he's not even a to play against. He's well, just exactly, insane. The guy Jesus plays three Christ. hours a day, and he's like the craziest athlete I've ever seen in my life. And he just dominated us. Oh. I'm like, I don't want to play this. He's game. trying to get me on the court. I'm like, it, yeah, no chance. He tries to get everybody out there. <laughs> yeah. He just can humiliate you. Yeah. 
It's awful. And I'm way too competitive, and I don't want. I'm, we're good friends. I don't want to end up in those. Terms you just go them. spear him. See, he went, <laughs> fuck you. Anyway, <laughs> see, he went viral like last week for his his fat ass. His ass. Yeah. He's got a. He's got he's a big all over line. ESPN. He's doing this interview, and everyone's like, "When the hell did Larry Fitzgerald get caked up?" It was crazy. He's always been that way. So this is the thing. <laughs> we have the. He introduced me to the person that does our our custom clothes, like suits and things like that. And it's funny when Larry gains weight because in the off season he would always gain a little weight. He doesn't go to his belly a little bit. To it was straight to his butt. <laughs> Straight to his, it's so funny. His legs just get this big, but the rest looks the same. You can see it's it funny from, as hell. From, the, from looking at him straight, you see it kind of just on the sides. It is amazing. He never looked like that before. It's nuts. No, he he did. I mean, on the football field, you can't tell, but he did. Yeah, it's true. just getting bigger. You mentioned playing someone with no strokes. You a lot of talk about what your like your true handicap would be. What do you think about 13. all of that? It's not plus. 13. What do you mean it's not plus thirteen? That's just unrealistic. Come on. <laughs> Plus 13 the thing is, is a shocking number. I have had some people, it, it is weird how kind of this works. I have some people at Serve Relief actually I play with um, that are two or three handicaps. I think one of them, I gave them 16 strokes. Well, they were playing as if, right? Like we weren't really having a game. And I ended up beating them by one. And they didn't have their best day. So I, I think 16 to, do to some people, I think if you're a higher handicap, there's a better chance of me possibly winning and making it a fair fight. Because right. uh, you can have a really bad day, and we can actually have fun against a scratch handicap. If I give him thirteen shots, I have no shot, like yeah. none whatsoever. So, this is a guy. This is a line there. Yeah, I see. I see. What? Uh, so you mentioned basketball court. You just like you like to just shoot hoops. It came with the house. I'm not gonna lie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? I would love to. I'm terrible at it. Me I'm too. terrible at it. Awesome. Me and Steph Curry still have a challenge pending. I'm probably gonna lose. So, what's the, what's the challenge? challenge? You guys didn't see it on social media. They asked him, "Was more likely." That I make five three pointers. If we started at the same time, it was him making five twenty footers or me making three pointers. Who make him first? He said five twenty footers. I'm like, if I can pick the putt, I'm saying me. Yeah, because I'm gonna you, give him. I think I'm gonna give him sure. the craziest break. And the funny I mean, thing I is, I got Damian Lee, his brother in law, involved. I'm like, hey man, you got to help me out because he plays golf, and I know Steph is a great golfer, so I got him involved and. Uh, he was asking for videos of my shooting technique. He was very kind. I know it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's just funny because especially at the house, I don't have the three point the the, U, the NBA yeah. three point line. So I don't know. I think if you pick an easy twenty footer, because I looked up the make percentage is pretty low. Yeah, what, it's really? very low. Single digits, right? From twenty feet, unless you're Jordan Spieth, is single digits. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah you gotta be. You there. gotta be able to get a basket. Uh, you can shoot a three. You got, well, but he plays a lot more golf than I play. Yeah, basketball. but you can get in the room. Even if he's like twenty percent, that's still. Way I feel like I can more. rapid fire more threes than he can do with putts. Yes. True. That's the only reason. If we have the same amount of attempts, he might have a chance. But if I, I feel like if I have endless amount of racks, I can just keep shooting until I make five. Twenty foot putts too hard yeah, for, a three, for a three for a three footer, a three a three pointer. NBA it's not three. Comparable. NBA. It's three. not comparable. Those NBA threes are deep. Yeah. Yes. Very deep. He thinks he'll think win. Got it. I think you win. I mean, I don't blame him for thinking he can win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you, what do you do? If it was reversed, he's winning a hundred percent. I know that. Yeah. He's what making you, five three pointers way before I made five, five shots. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do when you're free? Do you play like video games? What do you? I don't have that much free time right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, I used to play a lot. Yeah. Um, before we had kids, Call of Duty. I yeah. always play Call of Duty. I played either Warzone or. Would you wear the headset and get into it with people? I, I don't trust talk. I'm playing with my friends. I'm not going to. You break any controllers? No, God. I don't get mad playing video games. I do. I broke it. I'm control. terrible. I'm too bad to get mad. Like, I can't believe you're bad at these things. I feel like you'd be good at everything. Well, when I, in quarantine, I got decent. Yeah. I got decent. Uh, I played a lot more zombies in Call of Duty just because it would be two hours or, you know, survival, Easter eggs, blah, blah, blah. It was a little bit better. I got tired of going into, into multiplayer or going into a war zone and freaking land five seconds later you're dead you have to wait 10 more minutes to so respawn hard. it's annoying yeah. so it's just annoying resident nerd back there he's a big video game guy. Yeah, he's yeah exactly s- right and then i watch valorant and i want to watch apex and i'm like that was way Crazy. too hard Fortnite before people learn how to build skyscrapers in five seconds it was fun it was so much fun yeah it was fun they you know hide in a booze grenade launcher it was great a little bit of fun but people got too good so now what i have is the nintendo switch on the road and i played Ooh. zelda breath of the wild Oh, Zelda's great. So the new, I haven't played the new one. It's, it's. No, I mean either, but, uh, I'm trying to finish this one a hundred percent. All the side egg, all the side Easter eggs, all the side quests, everything before I move on to the next one. 
on the road a lot. Which, you... That sounds like a little bit too nerd, right? Like, <laughs> no, 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 all the items, everybody, all no, everything. No, you got to do it. But it's just it's just entertaining. And for flights, if the kids are asleep, you know, it's yeah. instead of watching a show, at least I'm putting your attention on something else. Do you watch? Yeah. Are you like a binger of shows? Do you get into the mix of like you know, The Last of Us now on HBO? It's a zombie uh, show. Have I haven't watched that? that actually. You would like that if you like zombies. So. I watch everything with my wife, obviously. She does not do good with anything scary. Drama, it's scary. Anything before bed. It's I'm with scary. her. I'm not doing it's like, it's jump scare. It's like, is what it is. like a straight up comedy it. or a little bit of like, like I just what got her. I told her, you're going to love Suits. Just got her into watching Ooh, Suits. Yeah. Good one. So I'm rewatching Suits. She's watching it for the first time. She's loving it. But like we watch like Modern Family, Big Bang Theory, yeah. Friends. Love Big Bang Theory. Yeah. You know what I mean? The my TVS special at Big night. Bang Theory is your favorite show. My is that right? Show. What? It's really good. It's good. I'm telling you. I've been trying to get these guys on it, and they're like, "Oh, it's this." It's, it's that. I don't say some that. people. I don't some say people that. have white noise. I just put one of those shows I've watched a million times. I do The Office. I put the iPad on the floor, and I just have it as sound, and I, I go to sleep I like that. Do that with The Office, dude. I can't yeah. go to sleep with that. I've you never do seen with the, the Big Bang Theory. I've never we, seen The Office. So what? I know. I, I you got The Big Bang Theory. You don't. Need I offend else. a lot of people. That's offensive. That's offensive. <laughs> I offend a lot. A lot of U.S. people. When I say how many of the American classics I have not watched, <laughs> yeah, and people that's get mad at me. You're, you're yeah, I've been right here right. for eleven years, man. I've had time. That's true. That's a good. That's a good. <laughs> we script. do this trivia show at Barstool, and um, one of the um, categories is like a niche category where it's like they're going to ask you a very specific question, and you have to make sure that you're a hundred percent on it. And Trent picks Big Bang Theory. Yeah, I really that's do love that show. That show. It's it's exactly what you're saying. It's. You can just have it on in the background, and I think there's very few questions I wouldn't get 100 percent on the show. Do you can remember you ask the him question the one that you didn't get wrong? That you didn't oh, get correct. We could probably pull. Yeah, it I up. think I just probably put my foot in my mouth. Right no, now. it was a tough question. It was a tough one, it's, but you might you might be able to. Get I don't know. Like, no, we the, we can. Well, I don't so, make it to the latest thesis that often. So I don't know. Do you remember the episode where Sh- uh, Sheldon and Raj go to a, a, a college mixer? Yeah. Okay. So with a Green Lantern lantern, yeah. <laughs> He did it. That's the answer that's that the I. That's the answer. That's the answer. answer. The one that he, he gave. Said, they said, what, "What was the gift that they gave him to that they gave him to try and persuade him to go on the date?" And he, it was the Green Lantern. <laughs> at first, at first, he gives him the Hulk. Come on, John Rom. Let's go. That's the whole fucking thing. That was the whole debate. John, listen. John, listen. That was the whole debate. That took over the internet. John, listen. So I got it wrong because I said Hulk hands, and they were like, "No, it's the Green Lantern lantern." I had the Parts of the episode switched around, but you would have gotten it right. You would have yeah. gotten it right, dude. Yeah. Whole cans. Can even tell you the drink that Sheldon gets. <laughs> what is it? It's a Shirley Temple. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because I, 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 it's funny because I never heard of that. I was telling Kelly, like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you never I heard of Shirley Temple? That. that was great. I do have a pretty good memory, but I, I you know, like, I didn't know it was going to be like that. I just, I don't know. I've watched it a lot. Now, that's the thing. Every night, it's either that. If you ask Kelly about Modern Family, she'll tell you anything. <laughs> Modern Family is a great show. Yeah, it's a good yeah. show. No, does, just... does your memory extend onto the golf course where you can remember every shot you hit throughout a tournament? A tournament? God, I can tell you every shot I've hit the last, I don't know how many years. Wow. I just, uh, it's something when I'm passionate about, I don't forget it. I yeah. don't know. Let's go seventh hole, final round, uh, Torrey Pines this past weekend. What, what that's happened? a bad hole. God. <laughs> Pull my driver on the bunker left, which usually is fine. But he went up against one of the tongs that comes in. So my foot was on the edge, ball below my feet. 153 meters into the wind of the left. You always go meters? This is yeah. psychotic. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I have no, yeah. I basically hit a seven iron, spun a bit too much, ended up in the bunker, didn't get up and down. You didn't even think of it. Like that just, mm-hmm. the fuck? Still rattling him too. You can tell he's like, oh, bad hole. No, it was very close. I mean, it's not that long ago. Yeah, oh, true. I can't remember what we ate last night. <laughs> yeah, well, we're idiots. I do, we're I do. If you ever talk to my coach in college, Tim Mickelson, I used to annoy the hell out of him <laughs> with with that because I remember everything. Yeah. And he would get very annoyed. Even Rory McIlroy a couple of times because I watch a lot of videos and highlights. I just love it. He like, I don't know, he, he was somebody sitting for the first time and I didn't realize I did this, but Rory's like, oh, be careful because John's going to tell you every single shot you ever hit. <laughs> I'm like... Sorry, man. Like, <laughs> I'm just, I like, I like the sport. What do you want me to tell you? Yeah, right. <laughs> do you watch golf coverage or you're not playing? I have a hard time watching the coverage. I'll watch highlights. You just don't think I just don't have four hours to sit down and watch the whole thing. Yeah. I actually, when I, cause I wake up early, I'll turn on European tour. Mm-hmm. When I'm having my coffee, when the kids are asleep, I'll watch European tour, but I'm never midday at home to be watching. Right. So I don't know. If it's on the range at the at the club or at the bar in the background, I'll be watching. But yeah, I mean, I love the sport. Like I said, I'll 
and I'll watch anything, anything that's on TV. If I have the time, I'll. You ever get uh, first tee jitters anymore? Yeah, yeah, I'm nervous. Yeah, yeah. It just means he matters. Right. The day you're not nervous, it means he doesn't matter. Like you get used to it, but it's still there. Attention, small business owners. Attention. 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 Attention, small business owners. You may be eligible to receive up to $26,000. That's a lot of doll hairs. Per employee. Per employee. For, oh, my gosh. For, uh, through the employee retention credit. Omega Accounting Solutions can help you recover payroll tax overpayments and determine if you are eligible to receive up to twenty six thousand dollars per employee that's really important because a lot of these small businesses they get cold called by like these sketchy businesses being like i can save your business money here and there whatever and like these tax no this is omega this is a legitimate brand that we know that is baby i mean that's like as legitimate of a name as you can possibly come up with and the fact that they are working on figuring out how to save these businesses money with all their payroll and their taxes and stuff is like if you're a business owner listen up attention that's why they say that. Omega is the... We have a, a champion on this show. Omega is the small business champion. Wow. John Rohn. With teams dedicated to maximizing tax credit. CPAs even turn uh, to Omega for ERC guidance. Take advantage of this exclusive small business tax credit now. The three-year sunset deadline for filing begins to close March 31st, 2023. So learn if you qualify today. Call 800 300 Nine E R C. That's eight hundred three hundred nine E R C. Again, that is eight hundred three hundred nine E R C. Or visit omegataxcredits.com slash barstool sports now. Again, you could call eight hundred three hundred nine E R C or go visit this website, this link right here, omegataxcredits.com slash barstool sports. So there's been a lot of talk this last week, especially about uh, integrity in the game. And I want to ask you about, I believe it was 2012 European Boys Championships. You finished second <laughs> in stroke play. Yes. Uh, playing for Spain. And then what happened? Yeah, we're on the drive home. I get to the, I get to my hotel room, put the bag down. I see this, an extra club in the bag. Uh, so as we're, uh, you know, had to talk to our coaches and we're like, hey man, I just signed the wrong scorecard because I played with 15 clubs. Wow. That crazy. Holy shit. And yeah, we, uh, my count, my round didn't count because I got disqualified. He counted somebody else's round and that took us from qualifying to the top eight to play for the championship and match play to being on the bottom eight and basically not mattering the next three days. That was how I met my, my, Tim Mixon, my head coach. That's that was his first introduction to me. Getting disqualified. How old were you at the time? Sixteen <laughs> or so? Yeah, sixteen. Sixteen. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, I think he was on the way back in the van. Something like that. Like I mentioned something like I think I played with fifteen clubs. So there was any part of you in the hotel room being like, eh? Or were you just instantly like I gotta tell somebody? No, no, I think I remember correctly now I was in the van when I thought like, hey, I might have played with 15. You just told your coach right away. Yeah, I think that's kind of what happened. What a game, man! That takes a lot. What I mean, a game! I would take the most. It takes. The I wasn't most. the only one. Somebody else did the same thing. Signed the scorecard and literally walked back in ten minutes later, saying, "Hey, I wasn't the only one to do that that day. Actually, somebody else did." So, it, 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 listen, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, we had won the year before, so it's okay. <laughs> Have you ever? Uh, I mean, golf's tricky, right? And then we talk about it's on the. It's on the golfer a lot when it comes to the integrity and that hopefully everybody's playing by the same rules and with the same yeah. integrity and all that. Is it, and I'm, most players have or all have, have you been in situations where somebody in your group has done something sketchy and you have to figure out whether you're going to say something or not? I've been accused a couple of times, uh, but I haven't had any situation where I had to say something. You've been accused by who? Well, at the Irish Open, the first one I won, where I marked a one-footer. And I marked it a bit oh, to the that. side because um, the player I was playing with had a foot and three inches. And just because it was raining with the umbrella, I didn't want to spend half of the time getting wet moving the stuff. So when I replaced it, I guess I didn't replace it on the right spot. 
But it's a putt this long. I guess I know it matters, but like it's raining sideways. So I'm like, put it down, finish, move on. Right. And that's when I was told mid round. And afterwards, they showed me the images, but it was to the discretion of the officials. I told them, I'm like, listen, it's raining. I have no idea. Right. So it is that situation, one of them. Um, I mean, things that happen like that to me is the some perspective. Like, if it's just a putt, you're never going to miss. Don't make a big deal out of it. Obviously, yeah. Memorial. I'm still pissed about that. Yeah. <laughs> but probably the greatest shot I'll ever hit in my career that I've hit till now and is never talked about and is tainted because my ball moved. Mm. When I wasn't even looking down, I was looking up while all that happened. So, right. Yeah. See, those are those instances are though like it's not like this guy's cheating. It's like there's something that occurred that you know changes your scorecard, but not necessarily that you were deliberately going out here. My way only to issue when something like know? that happens, first of all, they it has to be visible to the human eye. And I had myself, my caddy, Ryan Palmer, and his caddy close enough to all see it if that happened, right? Because I drew a pretty good light, so if it's moving, you're gonna see it, and. Nobody saw anything. It was a 4K camera zoomed up, and you see it move right. ever so slightly. So right. according to the rules, that shouldn't be a penalty. Now, if you're going to give me a penalty, don't wait till I'm done because then it's covering your ass and putting me on a bad light. Tell right. me on 17 so it still matters. It, it doesn't happen. Uh, like imagine a football game where somebody scores, right, and they win by, let's say, eight points. Like, oh, that touchdown didn't matter, but you still win by one. Well, it might have been consequential while you were playing the game right. totally right so i'm teeing off 17 and 18 with a five shot lead it's different to teeing off with a three shot lead for me and totally. ryan so when those things happen that to me is if you're going to make a change and you're going to allow people to call in and all those things to matter if you're going to penalize somebody you have to do what they're playing whose call is that in real time i have no idea <laughs> this doesn't happen that often in golf right that's the thing yeah but when it does you know i remember obviously the dj incident from 2016 at oakmont when it was like they, but they told him once it occurred, they, they told him whenever they told him in the middle of that round. I remember the Lexi Thompson one. In the, uh, where well, they Lexi, told her, they, somebody called at 3 in the morning. This is one of my things, too. Like If we're still signing scorecards, which to me is pretty useless right now, like we all know what we shot, the second the scorecard is signed, that score should not be allowed to change. Tiger was at th- two strokes yep. at the Masters, right? If you haven't caught that by the time the round is over. Yeah, I agree with that. Period. You cannot change it. Right. You shouldn't be allowed. Any changes should be done before the scorecard is signed. Or you On can't just punish somebody right. for signing something if you change the scorecard afterwards. Yeah, Lexus was the same thing, right? right. So it's another one that was this far. Yeah. So, right. How could you be like, oh, by the way, we just decided that this is against the rules and you signed an incorrect scorecard because we just decided this. Right. No, yeah, I signed correct. a correct We didn't scorecard. allow you to have this information prior to signing the, the card. That's nuts. That makes it's no like sense. like when somebody says this takes like aging poorly. Like, no, actually it aged perfectly. Like when During I said it, it was correct. Right. Right. When I signed the scorecard, oh, it was hate that. correct. On Twitter, exactly. man, like in our world, when like I'm a huge hockey fan, New York Islanders, and I'll be like, the Islanders are the best team ever tonight. And then they'll lose. And they'll be like, oh, are they not the best team ever now? It's like, well, at the time, they were winning 3 nothing, So, like, it was correct. <laughs> they were the you know best I mean? team. I was right. Right. Like, so so it's, it's, social media, man. That's oh, it's the worst. It does it ever get, like, does it get into your circle of, like, what's being said? And, like, you know, like, we make jokes on the podcast and we're like, he's 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 crazy out there. He's, he's blowing up today. Like, are, are you ever being like, fuck these guys, fuck that person, whatever? If I saw it, yes. I just don't see it. Okay. You don't see it. Don't, That's really impressive in this day and age. I don't have it on my phone. See, that's the way to do it, though. So, like, we're in a business where we have to be on it. He's, I wish I could do that so bad. He's in a position man. where uh, I tried, and it affects my mood, too. And it's not only when people talk about me. Right. If I post a picture or something about me and Kelly or God for me and my kids and somebody says something negative, yeah. it's seen right. my instant action is, okay, I'm going to find you, yeah. Yeah. and I'm going to break your face in. Right. Sorry, I'm not really doing that. Right. No, no totally. I, I think that's a natural reaction. That's, like, I remember me and Kelly were in, in New York for the first time. I'm in the Statue of Liberty. I posted a picture, and... I can only see so many gold digger comments right? when we met in college before I even was anybody, right? So uh, I just said, I'm done. I can't. So the stuff I post, I, I say it myself and it's things that I say, but I don't have it on my phone. I tell somebody to do it. Yeah. I can't. I just can't deal with it. That's honestly the healthiest way to live in the year 2023 if you think about it. Like you're like, you're in That's such That's why a... I don't have that much exposure because. Right. Because if you perform on the golf course, which you do, like your life is what it is. You don't have 
There's no reason. And to be you're on eliminating media. like what like the worst part of the world right now, which is like we're just sucked into this like how many verse. people are like getting depressive and trying to it's commit suicide horrific. because of anonymity. Yeah. It's horrific. If you had your ID, your social, and your freaking address yep. as your profile, where yet people can find you, maybe you wouldn't say the things you say. We're convinced like when we get like four or five messages of the same thing, it's the same guy just logging into five different things. Yeah. And we're like, how is that a lot? I've thought about doing a burger account. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about doing a burger account. That would be going amazing. off on people. If you do, can you let, I won't is tell anybody. I just want to follow it. I right. just follow. Like, why is Riggs following this guy? I think it would like, be too obvious. I think yeah. it would be way too obvious. <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, I said, already, there's already cases where it's too obvious. So uh, <laughs> there are <laughs> clearly. <laughs> well, the and Kevin Duran do it. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like, come on, that, that, I feel like that would happen to me too. Like I was just by accident do the wrong thing. But it's, it's, I've thought about it just for fun. Yeah. Wow, that would be incredible. I mean, you talked about before, like playing in a tournament that matters. Where, where, where are you standing right now in the state of the PGA Tour? Obviously, this has been a discussion for the past couple of years at this point. Like, how are you feeling about, you know, where everything is at right now? It's good. They're making changes that needed to be made. Um, it's sometimes you need a bit of a push. Yeah, uh, I've been asked many times. I don't think live was necessarily a bad thing, right? Yeah. You, you're getting a better product out of it, and this year is a bit of a bridged year into the changes that might come next year. So uh, you're gonna get it's already happening. The best players in the world playing together way more often, which is what we all want, and was what everybody watching TV wants, right? You want to beat the best, and you want to watch the best compete. So. Uh, that's already happened. I think it's great. I'm not going to get too into the, the price money. Um, it is what it is. I, I've been blessed to do what I do, and I make plenty of money already. Uh, but obviously doubling it, great, wonderful. It's great for all of us. I, I think they're going, doing, going on the right track. I just uh, I hope you know this gets done right and we end up with a much better product, not only for us but for the fans. That's the main thing, right? The fans, the PGA Tour Basically, fan base needs to grow a little bit, and I think especially in the younger generations, that's when it needs to get a little bit better. Yeah, how do you, how would you do that if you were the commissioner? How would you try to grow? It's and, not my job. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard. Obviously, social media is the the way you need to go, and I think Netflix, the Netflix documentary is going to be big, even though I'm not doing it. I think it's going to be big in that sense. Were you involved at all? Did they ever grab you or mic you up or no? Uh, no, I, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to see what the first season was going to be like before I attempted. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, with all these people going to live, I don't know if they're going to be in it next year. If they need to make a villain, I'm a very good candidate for them to make a villain. <laughs> I don't want to be. I'm not that guy. Like what you see on the golf course and you see off the golf course, it's a very different person. So I don't want to be put in that light. Um, then when I saw Verstappen saying that they were making up things about them, I'm like, God, if they're making things up about something that is so exciting to watch, what can they make up about a golfer's life? Right. That's where, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do anything like that. I've heard, uh, I talked to Tony Fino, who's a good friend of mine, who he watched this episode and he said it was great. I think I might be in it because I did his fundraiser and I did tell him, hey, don't cut me out of this. It's a wonderful thing Tony's doing. So if there's something valuable here, keep it. I don't want to be the reason why this gets cut off. And then there was one interview. <laughs> At the U.S. Open, we were having lunch before the second round or the third round. It was Colin, Rory McIlroy, and I. And the Netflix cameras in there. And one of the jokes we made is at the time, and I don't know if I can say the spoiler, but oh, it's already been shown. Rory's going to be in, I think, yeah. season yeah. two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, at that point, Rory hadn't decided. So we're on the table, and I'm like, Colin, you're going to be talking to yourself for about 30 minutes here. Because <laughs> they can't show us, right? So I'm like, I think they showed a bit of a snippet of it. Uh, but that's the two times you might see me on the documentary. That's, yeah. And maybe highlights, obviously, walking by and things like that. But right. yeah, that's about it. I was, I, I'm going to watch it and background. see how it is next year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, make I mean, Lewis Hamilton did that. I think some others. Yeah. It was a big moment when Lewis Hamilton came in. So maybe it could be like that. <laughs> he gives him 20 minutes a year. That's yeah. it. Yeah. It minutes. was great. I remember the Darth Vader. You're the goat. You can do it. Oh, yeah, it was 20 so minutes. cool. When but they in season three, they're going to do the Darth Vader They would die for John 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, they would kill for that. Oh my so, God! You kidding? That's me? all Hamilton gives them twenty minutes a year, basically. So they can use any other interview, yeah. any other image, anything. But 
directly to a Netflix camera, they get 20 minutes. That's a good point. When he, when they build him up as almost like this mysterious figure who's just dominating, you don't really get anything personal or intimate. And then they bang, he sits down in the chair, whatever episode that was, like episode yeah. seven or eight. You're like, holy fuck, we're about to get, we talked about it like it was like, game, like you Game of Thrones, like you hear about yes. a character who's in some part of the world that you never see. And then like Cersei sits down. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, and you're like oh shit. my God, I'm going to get her. <laughs> that's incredible. That's very self aware of you though to like know. Like you don't want to be, you don't want them to manipulate it in any way where it's like, oh, you know, we don't have anything going on, so we, we're just going to make John Rom like what everybody thinks John Rom is. That's very well, self aware. To be also at first, we had just had Kepa, we had just moved, and Kelly was pregnant with the second. I'm like, too much. Yeah, I don't need any other, you know, outside influence on our life right now. There was too much going on, too much change going on. So that was also one of the main reasons why we I didn't do it. So on the live front, you've been, you've been, I feel like one of the, uh, guys that's both a, a key face of the PGA tour, but also very reasonable and rational in the understanding and accepting of live and lives place. And obviously Phil Mickelson, he was a mentor for you. Yeah. Uh, his brother was on his back. It's your coach, your agent, the whole deal. How, um, you know, how difficult has it been at, at all for you to, not play both sides, but to be n- not to not come off as hardcore as PGA or bust. Well, I'm being myself. First of all, I'm giving you my opinion, and it's not my place to judge what anybody else does. They're full grown adults; they they can make a decision for themselves. I can agree with it or not, but this is not going to change how I operate with my friends. Do I agree with everything that Phil said? No, and I've told him that, and we've talked about it, and we've had our discussions. Right? He tells me what he thinks PG2 has done wrong, and I tell him what I think they've done wrong. And that's very adult discussion. We don't have to agree. right? And then uh, another great friend of mine, mainly because it's really funny to hear him go off, is Pat, Pat Perez. And he tells me his side, and I told him, I'm like, Pat, he was honest, though. Like, he was always kind of against live, and then the opportunity came, and he said, I'm gone. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> good. Yeah. Fully understand. I fully understand why a lot of people have gone, so I don't judge it. Right, it, it it is what it is, and I've also expressed why I don't like live for now. Just don't like the format. I don't like a bit of what they stand for right now, but they could grow into something interesting. I do believe there is a way of coexistence in the future. I don't think you're gonna be able to play both sides, obviously, but I think there is a way to coexist and have both tours. Uh, I think it's only if you look at it from the perspective of the game of golf. I think it's only good to have another different way of playing it or a different way of doing it right i don't think it's necessarily a bad thing i just hope the bad blood and the bad comments in between kind of end just let them be them do what they want and that's it it's interesting because i i love to hear you say that because in today's world with i think social media drives this heavily but everything is so polarizing oh, and so you either divisive. hear or here, have to be. And if you're, if you're on the other side, you can't possibly be friendly with one another. You can't yeah, possibly have a rational, reasonable yeah. discussion. And that sucks because that's sort of the bedrock of a lot of what this country's built on is it's good to disagree. If you're a human being and you have a brain and opinions, you're not going to get four or five things down the list with any other human being on earth before you disagree with them on something. Oh, God. <laughs> so it's, I think it's such a wrong ideology to have to impose your own ideas on somebody else. Right. Did, Everybody's educated different. Everybody comes from different backgrounds, cultural, racial, and ethnicity, right? So nobody, not all of us are going to think the same. It's ludicrous to think everybody's going to think the same. And you can disagree in a few things and agree in most, and still they put you in a label that you might not be part of. And, yeah, I just, again, that's why I say you can have a discussion with them. I went up to Poulter, up, up BMW Wentworth, and, and everybody was fighting with each other. I'm like, what do you want? Straight up, what do you want out of this? Right? Why are you guys here? And he told me, and I said, great. I listened. It's great to know. It's not my place to tell you where to go or not to go. Um, I'm not going to get too political. <laughs> Obviously, it's not my place, but that's kind of how I feel. Um, I can maintain a friendship with somebody and a good friendship with somebody and disagree in certain things. It won't... There's very few things that would make it a make or break situation. As long as you're being respectful to me and my family, I think you can make it happen. 
So are you, for the Ryder Cup upcoming uh, later this year, obviously the European team's been uh, probably more decimated by the lived affections of what's going to potentially mm-hmm. happen? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. U.S. has some too. But are you hoping, are you pushing at all for the live players to be allowed to play in the Ryder Cup? I'm an advocate for them to be able to play. Yeah. Selfishly, me and Sergio had a lot of fun in the Ryder Cup, and I think it would be a great pair. But, again, it's not my decision. You need to make sure the locker room environment is but you have a big voice in golf. You're, you're, I yeah, well, I, I'm telling them, but again, if there's more to it than just golf, right? Like if there's politics involved, they're not going to listen to what I say. Yeah. In my mind, the Ryder Cup is above everything else. It's not Liv versus PJ Tour or anything else. It's Europe versus the U.S., period. That's what it should be. Best Europeans versus best Americans. But um, again, if there's bad blood between players, in either which side, you don't want to. You don't want to have that. And I hope the PGA and European Tour make a united front. Right? You don't want one team to allow them and one team not to. So yeah. whatever they decide, they just decide to do it together, and, and that's it. How much does the Ryder Cup mean to you? Where does it, where does it stack in your – Well, a lot. I play golf because of the Ryder Cup. I've, I've spoken a few times. Uh, nobody in my family ever played, and a few of my dad's friends were in, next to Valderrama when the 97 Ryder Cup happened, and they saw what it was, and they're like, oh, let's give this a try. My dad always tells me when they told him, he said, oh, this, you know, what is this? What is this? Like, this is, this is not for real, man. What is this? And then he tried it and loved it. So I'll keep in mind, my dad was into free skiing, free rock climbing, paragliding. So adrenaline was part of, like my mom and him both hiked the Mont Blanc, which is the tallest mountain in Europe, and ski it down. There's no ski slopes. You just ski it down, free skiing. Or go up a mountain, throw on the parachute, and run off a cliff and go down. <laughs> what? That's, Dude, yeah. And free rock climbing? That's like that's fucking rock Jason climbing Horn. and free rock climbing. So not free solo, but okay. not, he's, yeah, not, yeah. <laughs> he's not Alex Honnold. But <laughs> he, uh, he did stuff like that. So obviously when they bring up golf, he's probably going to think, yeah, this yeah, is You're like, what the hell he is loved this it. shit? He, he probably got to a point. I think he had a crash when my mom was pregnant with my brother or me. And broke his elbow, and he realized, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I do something that I can do Just for a play long some time. Golf. Yeah, yeah. So because of that, they started playing golf. So I, I asked him a lot of times, like, what would have been? Because nobody in our family knew anything about golf. My dad, at forty or close to forty, was the first one to try. Wow, it's a movie scene. It it's is introduced via the Ryder and then Cup. Here we are. Right? Has uh, so obviously the uh, the pandemic uh, led to a boom in golf in the U.S. Is it God. the same in Spain? Uh, Similar? I think so to a little bit of an extent. Yeah. Because they did close the golf courses down in the entire country for okay. a very long time, longer than here. Yeah. Actually, they were always open here. A lot so. of, yeah, most of them were open here. So not as much as it could have been had they stayed open. How big is golf over there? Not as big as you would think. I think, what is it? I heard someone like ten percent of the population of a U.S. plays golf or something like that. Yeah, uh, in Spain is less than one percent. Wow. Um, I think. Is it exclusive over there? It has still has that stigma of being yeah. for rich people, which couldn't be farther from the truth. Obviously. Yeah. So uh, we're we're hoping it grows. I mean, there's uh, there's some things we're doing. I'm trying to do it myself, obviously, um, in collaboration with other people to to try to make it grow. So. One of the great things I would love to be able to make it happen is to see some top golf over there. I think top golf could be, and now that I have it on my sleeve, mm-hmm. it could be something that helps people understand that it's not just for rich people. Top golf's been great. Yeah. God, money printing machine. Jesus Christ. It's <laughs> everywhere, man. It is everywhere. It's insane. It's, it's a great a idea. Great it's thing for the, Callaway the, to buy them because, my God. I know. <laughs> Yeah, it's everywhere. I mean, there's like two here. There's there's nice. top calls everywhere. It is the, it is tough. I mean, I you know I kind of asked you earlier, how would you get, you know, how would you grow the game with the younger generation if you were the commissioner? And it's it's, I think that's sort of the answer is showcasing to people because that barrier to entry of going from not playing golf at all ever to now you're gonna go. There's gonna be a 90 year old starter. You're gonna play golf for five hours, 18 holes. It's gonna yes. be like, that's too much of a barrier to entry. It's too intimidating. But I do think. If you can get people, if you can get their toes in, dip their toes in a little bit. You're like, there's going to be a bar there. Yeah. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be a fucking bar. And they're like, I'm in. Oh, but I, I think, think that's I think the key, right? It, a lot of that needs to change, right? Like, So I, I'm glad to be a member where I'm at. Like, When people, a lot of people go to play golf, the last thing you want is more rules. Yeah. Like, be respectful to each other. But the last thing you need is more rules of, 
I think the etiquette problem is a big one for the younger generations. I think that's an issue. Yeah. You could go play in sweatpants and a hoodie everywhere. I think a lot more people could sign up to do it. Yeah. Which I think I see that change more and more nowadays. So um, I wouldn't know how else to. There's got to be a way to do it. Uh, obviously, it's not my job to think about things like this, but there's no. got to be a way. And I think that's not that you want to encourage the drinking, but having a, a bar accessible always helps people yeah, show it's up. It's supposed anywhere. to be an escape yeah. for people, right? It's not exactly. supposed to be more. It is for me more. too. Like yeah. I can play seriously, and I can go play with my friends where I go and have a couple of drinks. There's very different ways to play this sport, and the beauty is you can play with anybody thanks to the handicap system. So um, it's just about starting. Like it takes a bit of time till you get to a certain level to enjoy playing. Anybody from a young age can run, can can jump, run, and catch, and throw. That's why other sports are so much easier to get into. So how, how is your game when you have a couple soda pops in you? I actually had a joke with Patrick Mahomes where – so in server leave there's um, – and guy, this is going to make me come out like such a drinker, but I'm not. <laughs> I do not drink. And uh, on number six and 15, this conversation is a relief, right? And with the owner, when the owner was drinking, he would always force everybody in this group to take a tequila shot, which is fine. One shot doesn't do anything. Two shots over four hours, right? And we're playing with Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey in, in the off season, and they saw me do it, do that because I always play against Ben Herman, and who's the owner of Server Leaf. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we always have a tight match, and he would say how the next three, four holes after I will take a shot, I would actually play better golf. <laughs> and we did. It was three days in a row where that happened. Like the next two, three holes, birdies would be coming, and it was funny how he was telling me, "Dude, I'm going to the Masters this year. I'm bringing you shots." On <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, I don't think that's good for you or me, but thank you." Now, there's obviously a point where I just don't care. Yeah. I don't know how people play better drunk. I've seen a lot of people do it great. It's crazy. I, my limit is not that high, and it gets to a point where I just don't care enough to be playing. If we see John with, like, a, a an unmarked bottle of, like, mm-hmm. yeah. water, just, like, walking down 12 at Augusta, we're going to know that there's no, something. I just signed a tequila deal. Come on, man. <laughs> Birdies four holes in a row. Like, That's right. What's going on out there? He was two over, and then I smell your breath for a second. I do that way too often on tour of, like, bogeys, and then three birdies coming up, so... I think yeah, that's my, more exciting than just my par, bounce par, par. back. My bounce back stats pretty good. So it's because you get fired up. It's funny you say that. Yeah, exactly. Because I got I just signed the tequila deal. So oh, what kind of tequila are we talking? Uh, Maestro Dobel. Love it. Just yeah, I'm a, an ambassador for them. So I, I what's the name? I, 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 you said it so like incredibly. What was it? What's the what's the name of it? Maestro. Maestro. So in Mexico is Maestro Tequilero. Maestro over, Tequila. Over here is Dobel. Okay. D O B E L Maestro. It's Maestro. Right. We're gonna have to try some of that. I like tequila, tequila, your go-to? Is that what, if you're going to have a, yeah, like you a, a Blanco or Reposado guy? Depends on the brand. Okay. Depends on the brand. So this brand, God, I'm going to redo a marketing now. I was no, talk to. about it. It's the official sponsor of the PGA Tour. Carlos Ortiz, who's now on live, actually had them on the sleeve. Oh. oh it's a big tequila in Mexico. So they actually, they're, they obviously have everything, but the two main one, the main one they want to sell is called Diamante, which on the bottle will say Reposado, but that's only because if you're mixing tequilas and HS and tequilas, you have to put the youngest tequila in the mix, even if it's 1%. Oh. So nobody knows the true recipe because this is the owner who sits down and basically mixes in the glass Come until on. he likes it. So <laughs> he, he's, it's got Añejo, it's got Reposado, it's got Blanco, it's got Extra Añejo. And what they do is they filter it so it looks it's cristalino, it's white. So when you're mixing it in drinks because it tastes better, it doesn't look red. Like if you put Añejo in a margarita, it looks red. And I was like, people get thrown off. Mm-hmm. So they did it because of that. And and it's real, that's really good. Whether you're drinking it alone or mixing it, it's high quality. I'm thirsty. Had I known, I mean, I know it's 11 a.m., but I could have brought some. <laughs> <laughs> After this interview, we're on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, they have a couple different ones. And uh, they started, it's funny because the owner told me the story recently. They started by accident, right? It's, it's owned by the you know, people that that own Cuervo, Jose Cuervo. It's like a like a specialty tequila. The CEO started, and it was an accident. Really? A complete accident, yeah. The, he told me a friend of his dad's, uh, he was retiring, and he said, oh, make me a tequila, and I'll have X amount of boxes, and we'll do something with it. And, you know, a friend of theirs made the glass, and then, so they made the glass bottles, right, and, and they ship them. It's like, I right, filled them up. It's like, well, we have 20,000 cases. It was supposed to be 500 bottles. It was 20,000 cases. What do we do with this? And the now CEO, his son, said, we'll just make another tequila. And we call him Maestro Dobel. Dobel was a previously failed enterprise. 
and it's it's his basically his initials. His name is is Juan Domingo Beckman. Okay. Legarreta, well, that, that last name, it's, it's from my region in Spain. Don't worry about that's it. Tough one, yeah. But it spells Dobel, that's plays his last name. And his dad said, isn't that a little presumptuous of you? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, dad, don't worry about it. So they started it and ended up being, it's like his baby. So that's why he sits down and he does the tasting and he makes it the tequilas. And ended up being, now it's probably one of the most popular. So Mexico is just not known in the U.S. yet. Gotcha. But very affordable for price. What a beautiful language. It's amazing. It's so I'm much nicer. Like, I'm saying water and pizzeria. Our English is gross. He's fucking... You can put me to sleep with that thing. It's very <laughs> beautiful. I was like mellow just listening to you just say names. It's, it's just a cool story. Like when it's you a great story. The background of it, so. it is a great story. Yeah, we actually just launched it last week on Tuesday. They were left of the eighth hole last week. Oh, wow. So okay. we're working on that. Uh, my favorite mix drink with tequila is a Paloma. So we're working on yeah. – they have their own mix. We're trying to make it uh, – add some things that I like to make it my own. So maybe in some future PJ Tour events, if you go to their tent, you'll see the, the Rambo Paloma. It's a beautiful story. I had a I have a story, but it's a dark story. Real quick one. It's not surprising. A lot of dark, dark stories with tequila, though. So I don't know. <laughs> no, this, this is dark. And this is him. a dark story. I was telling Brendan about it yesterday, but I think, and since this is going to be the full podcast, I wanted to get this out Where there. Where is this going to go? It's a dark story. I'll say, John, this could go anywhere, so buckle it's crazy. up. It's crazy. You know, it's just something that I, I think everyone <laughs> should remember the John this there's, there, there's, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But no, there's a story. There's you a meaning behind this. You guys were talking this. on a podcast about the golden record for 45 minutes. I mean, I'll think. <laughs> 40, what'd you, what do you think about that golden record? I had no idea about it. It was pretty it's kind interesting. kind of bullshit, too, the, the, what they came up with. I'm sorry, sorry. I'm cutting you, you off, No, man. we should have had Utah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm I would rather you have your, I would rather we'll have get Utah. to the golden record. We'll get to the golden so record. Basically, so I'm Let's talking to this, one of my buddies, a police officer, and he's telling me, he always tells me these crazy stories about things that happen, right? And we're talking about this call that he went to and this girl sitting down. What, and this has nothing to do with anything we've talked about, by the way. That's really? Not, okay. Again, that's, yeah. So, so this girl's sitting down in a chair. She's watching TV. And all of a sudden, she hears a boom go off. And glass shatters behind her. She's like, what the fuck was that? She's looking around. She has no idea what's going on. Turns out the guy next door was like either cleaning his gun or something or doing something with his gun. Gun goes off, goes through the walls, yeah. through her apartment, and then explodes somewhere in the back, right? Jesus. Craziest part about this story is that where the bullet ended up is right on top of her toilet where if she was going to be sitting there would have like hit her. Yeah. And it goes right into a picture frame that says life's too short, travel the world. And the bullet is, is lodged right in the middle of it. Yeah. Tell me that's not the craziest, like life imitates art or like, this is like why we need to take every single day, like with a special meet. Cause like the girl, you know what I mean? Like, Wow. You're just sitting down in your apartment and something could just, just go wrong. This bullet is still in this piece of art. I think she could sell this thing for a million dollars if you tell that story. Oh, yeah, I swear, I think you could sell that piece of art for a million dollars on some like, you know, crazy art. People wouldn't display. believe it. How crazy is that it's story? Like a I haven't been, I, I can't stop thinking about it for the last like 48 hours. Is that making you feel like you're cherishing it? Yeah. Everybody? You know, we're here to interviewing John Rahm. It's like every day special, man. All right. I, I'm with you. Isn't that an insane story? It is. No, it really is. Little perspective pie. It's still in there. It's crazy. She's going to leave it the, forever. The, right? the sign says, life is short, travel the world. So what is she doing? I don't she's know. Hopefully, travel the world hopefully now. she's booked I her hope first. So. Hopefully she's booked her first fucking flight you to like Spain You just got to quit your job and start, start moving. <laughs> she's going to have one week where she's perspective <laughs> oh, pie she and she's going to be right back into like normal, like, yeah, just taking, a, taking a shit, looking to the left. Well, not everybody has the freedom to be able to do it. But true. That's true. That's true. What do you think about that golden record? I thought they could have done better with the contents of it. Well, back in the day, I forgot who's That's in true. it and who's not in it. It's like uh, not that many big names are in it. And the Beatles, we, the Beatles were. The in Beatles it. weren't. Remember, they they, they were. wouldn't release it. Oh, that's the right. The Beatles doesn't. wouldn't give them the what rights to the record, even though it was going to outer space. Go to fucking aliens. What do you think about? What do you think about outer space? You, you feel like you're an opinionated the guy. The Beatles not on there. Was Michael Jackson on it? No, no. Mm. It was like Beethoven and like no, Mozart. Jesus, it was yeah. a good yeah. amount of composers. What's your thoughts on outer space? You don't want to send controversy out into the world. I get it. What's your thoughts yeah, on outer universe. space? Sorry. Yeah. What's your thoughts on outer space universe? In what sense? Like, this do you think about it? Long subject. Do you ever think about it? Like, do you ever just like you know just like. Yeah, it's exactly why I said I don't think too much of myself. Right. Out of the 7 billion people on this planet, we're a very small part of a large universe. And don't think we're the only ones. True. So to people for people to think that I'm a big deal to me is just like I'm not. not you are close. a big deal. But people do look at the zoom out picture and they there's two ways to go about it. One, and I agree with you where it's like I'm just a, I'm a speck of that. 
And then there's guys like Frankie who look at that and they get anxious about <laughs> I it. I get anxious, but also I was listening anxious, to Anxious, Bert- why? It's just, it's, it's scary to me. The whole thing is horrifying. Like, is it over, why? Overwhelming? It's just, it, none of it makes sense to me. And I try and like really wrap my head around what's actually happening. I feel like we all just go through life being like, this is what we're doing. I feel like and you like, would be the one to think we're in a simulation. A little bit. He does. Yeah. He says it every he show. Thinks- Not in like a weird way, more in like a, Maybe it's a weird way, but like more in like a. So he likes the, the Matrix. Got what, it. Yeah. No, just like what the hell is actually really like going Harry Potter, on here? Going Harry Potter. I was listening to Burt Kreischer. He was talking with Louis C.K. on a podcast, and he was like, sometimes he thinks that like the more like pe- some things happen to other people, he realizes it just can't happen to himself. Yeah. I actually really bought into that. Well, you also think that he <laughs> he's thinks like that, all these people are dying around me, but I just keep living. Maybe I can't die. <laughs> he's like, it's, a, it's insane. This is like, going to get. I don't know the answer yet. Even we <laughs> don't know the answer yet. <laughs> no one knows the answer yet. He we're also still thinks doing it. I've been successful to this Frankie point. also thinks that we're all droids and that he's the main character. No, it's something it's, it goes into your Jesus. mind once in a while. All right. <laughs> I don't think you're the side character, John. I don't. What kind of music in, do you in, listen to? In your story, maybe. In my story, I'm not. <laughs> what kind of music do you listen to? God, that's a quick change in subject right yeah, there. We, we from don't. that too. You, you, you get him going. <laughs> we'll keep you here for four hours. I was just say we got. Yeah, we can't. Well, I could talk for a while too. Music. I listen to anything. I listen to anything. Uh. You got any Spanish bangers for us? I'm, I listen to the same shit. I could use some like uh, spice. I honestly, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I'm one of this like is very stuck on my ways. Like I have, yeah. I don't explore out to new music that often. No. Same. That's uh, why, like, I try to get to like Discover Weekly pod, like or uh, playlist on like, yeah, Spotify or something, so you get some new shit in your rotation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't always listen to music when I'm practicing. Um, if I do, I just put Pandora because. I don't want to be choosy. I remember Brooks Kepka said he doesn't listen to music because the sound of the ball is important to his like practice session. It depends on what. Like if I'm just warming up and I want to get my my head clear and just hitting shots and stuff like that, I, I get it. I can't hit golf balls with both headphones on. No. Okay. It's weird. I will do it with one. Even when I warm up, I do it with one. Yeah. Yeah. What's so. your What's your uh, So right now, I want to get kind of a your own take on your own. Game. Obviously, you won two in a row. Uh, you're in the final group this last weekend. You, I believe, have not finished outside the top eight in five events in this wraparound 2022-2023 year. You got a little bit of a week off here, but then you kind of keep rolling. Where Where are you at with your own game? Very happy, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very happy, and the, there's still things that I can improve, right? And I know I can improve, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I can make cases for everything, right? When I was a... We were in Congaree. I had a good chance, started great on Sunday, and then I just didn't play good. That week, actually, I never really had it. I just I shot the one nine under because I made everybody looked at, but that's about it. Um, and Sony had the bad Friday that put me too far away, uh, very far away. So just would have liked to be closer starting the day. And then Sunday in Palm Springs, actually, I can't say much. I did good on Sunday. I just I lived out six times. That was a good tournament. Yeah, how, that seventy four. It's you know you felt like you felt like you still had it. Sunday at Torrey. Yeah, yeah. It's a hard golf course, man. You yeah. get a couple bad breaks. I made a double on five, and I'm like, geez. I mean, it hit the car path, ended up in a dead spot, and I went from bad to worse. Can you minimize it sometimes? Yes, I just that day was not. Uh, and that was what was a four over standing on the eleventh tee. I finished two, which I'm pretty happy about. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just it's a hard golf course. Dude. I can't I can't really explain like you you know the two under to two over changes very quickly over there, and and yeah, there's things that I can change. Like I wouldn't say I've been playing my best golf. I've been playing really good golf, but I can get more comfortable on the golf course and do better things. Uh, it can always improve. So that's that's what I'm really happy about. Like I'm still in a great state game wise, and I think I've done other changes that are making me feel so good, allowing me to play better. Uh, I don't really know how to explain like how I feel physically in certain aspects and mentally. Um, you know, I go out there in a really good state to play golf, so I feel really strong out there as well. So I, it's it's more my preparation has been much better. So even if my swing is not as best it could be, it's still producing really really high results. When you're in a spot like at Palm Springs and you look at the leaderboard and you're John Rahm, do you do you feel like you can use that to your advantage? At a leaderboard of I've done this. I'm a major champion. I think so. I'm the fucking guy. I mean, I don't think about it actively, but uh, I mean, I wasn't going to go out on my way on Sunday to you know be friendly and chatty to Davis Thompson. Yeah, I'm not. So that's kind of like 
if it's somebody I know, and even Tony Fino and I, who are good friends, barely spoke on Sunday. So uh, <laughs> that's such an interesting like dichotomy to me. Yeah, like I wouldn't. Like we're in the arena now. Yeah, kind of. Especially we both weren't playing great, so he gets mad too. People don't believe it, but he's he gets quiet as well. <laughs> uh, so it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of how it is. Like, I don't... You, you use it to our advantage, because exactly, especially at that golf course in Palm Springs, I'm like, I've won here, right? Like, I've I've done it before. I know how to do it, so I know what I need to do. That's basically... Uh, you, you'd use it for an advantage. Obviously, when you go into one of those where it's just a start-filled leaderboard, well, everybody be thinking the same thing. So, make you, the best man win. Uh, so, distance. Distance in the last uh, couple of years, three years, I guess, has become... A huge talking point. I Why believe. though? Why is everybody so obsessed with distance? I can you? simplify it since Tiger. There's better ways to screen the human body. There's better ways to make people work out in the gym to make the sequence better and make themselves more efficient. And technology is just a little bit better. I get it. But overall, we're all better athletes. It happens in every single sport. In every single sport. There's actually a tech talk about that, how much better... Uh, athletes are nowadays for the most part uh, but the technology is allowing things like they said if Jesse Owens and Usain Bolt on their records would have run together the difference would have been minimal minimal interesting right and that was 1940 1940 1940 something like that sure 1936 maybe. no 1936 when Jesse Owens in Germany so compared to Usain Bolt doing it in 2009 I mean just think about football players same thing, faster, strong basketball. Yep. It hasn't changed since the 80s. <laughs> yeah, big time. Well, exactly. So it's going to happen to every sport. Same in tennis. You watch McEnroe win to how they're playing now in Wimbledon. Yeah. It's a completely different sport. Now, in our case, I think what they're doing, which is trying to stretch golf courses, it's only going to feed into people hitting it longer, period. It's getting to a point where if you have rough like this and you have 520-yard par fours, you're going to need to hit a 340 because otherwise you're not going to get to the green in any other way. Right, So they're feeding into us needing to hit it longer. And I think it hinders the game when they try to roll back the ball and change things with the technology of the clubs. We're going to get to a point where I would be the smallest on tour. You're going to get people who are 6'5", J.J. Watt-looking people who are going to be hitting it 380 down the center. Like it's get, Eventually it's going to get to something like that. Do you focus on trying to you know, stay up at the top with distance? Because I... Last year, I think you were fifth in, in distance on tour. I think this year you're ninth. Like, is no, that it's, it's been, or you're you're totally in the year. Uh, I, don't, I actually don't do speed training. Yeah. I've just been getting stronger in the gym. Uh, I've, I've talked about my, my right leg in the past, and it took me a solid six, seven years of working with my coach to get my body to where I could start doing certain lifts and lift heavier and get stronger. So now the last two years, you're seeing the, you're seeing the payout of all that work. That's basically what's happened, and that's what's allowed me to hit it longer. That's basically why when I turned it last year and I was cruising on the low 80s, is where that was the main thing. It was basically I'm able to, on that off-season, work out and get a lot stronger and, and have the speed to be able to do it. But I don't do any of the speed sticks or anything like that, trying to get faster. When you're working on your game, are you working on certain shot shapes for certain tournaments? I mean, I know you like to cut the ball off the tee. Were you leading up to Augusta? Try to draw it more? Yeah, and it's still something that's hard for me to do it consistently with the driver. Uh, it's complicated. You don't always need to draw it, especially with them changing 13 a little bit now. It might be actually better for me. Yeah, and DJ, when he won there, I mean, I know it was the November he can one. Draw it. He, he can draw it. He was drawing it? He can if he wants to. Yeah. Uh, I think at Augusta, yeah, I mean, there's a couple tee shots that predominantly you want to draw it. Obviously, 10, 13, 14 come to mind. But... Uh, it's not as big a hook as people make it look. Ten but feels like a hook. It's not. I mean, you can because you have plenty of room, but you don't really need to. Okay. It's it's a, it's a healthy draw, but it's not as big as. <laughs> I'm gonna start calling it that when I hook draw. one. The draw. people that can, <laughs> there's people that can snap hook it if they can. Yeah, do it. Go ahead. Do that. Like if it was the other way, I could slice a driver easily way yeah. down the fairway. But um, 13 and 14 are not as big a draw as people. It's more about really threading the line. It's a very small margin on 13 and 14 if you get close to the trees. That's what it is. This have to be accurate. 
What about the Open Championship? I mean, Scottsdale is about as different terrain as you could possibly have. Is it hard to prepare you, you'll for? You'll I mean, work on it. I mean, you can't get ready for an Open Championship unless we really play Open Championship golf courses. It's as yeah. simple as that. But you can work on your trajectory control, spin rate control, ball flight control. So, uh, and for me, the ball striking out there is not usually the issue. It's the greens and the and the touch around the greens because the greens are so much slower. That's that's mainly the the hardest part. You go out there early though, right? You play a couple events. Yeah, yeah. Usually go early and try to get used to those that type of greens. I love to. You always play in the Spanish. Every you're still going to do. I that? always will. I think it's my duty as a Spanish golfer to reach what I reach because of golf in Spain for me to go and give back and do it. Hell yeah, that's awesome. It's my. I, I see it as my duty. Um, you know, Savi being my hero. When he started playing, there wasn't many pro events in Spain. When he died, there were eight. And now we're down to two or three. Mm. It was, I think, one at one point when I started. And now we have two and getting close to three. So I think it is part of my duty to keep growing the game in that sense. And it's insane to see when I go there, man, because the amount of people following the group. I, that's the only time I feel like Tiger. Yeah, It's absolutely <laughs> ludicrous. <laughs> and that's probably why some of my best performances have been there. Because to have that support, it's crazy. Definite home court advantage. Because yeah. the second I finish a hole, everybody's sprinting somewhere else. Everybody's moving. <laughs> they move for me too, but it's it's super, super cool. And that's why I love going. Yes, I could win a tournament and lose world ranking points. Yes, the payout is nothing to be compared to what we do nowadays. It's, it's, it's nothing. But it's uh, that's not the reason why I play the game or why I go to Spain. It's really cool because I know that week every year, that's what the headlines are. It's like John Rahm is playing. It's actually is is one of the hardest weeks for me all year because the attention, the amount of media I have to do, and the expectation of me having to win. Because obviously I'm always gonna I'm always gonna be the highest ranked player when I go, hopefully right. for a long time, and I'm expected to win. And I've done it already three times, and everybody wants me to win by a margin, and it's it's tough. Like when I finish that week, I'm dead. It's is one of the hardest for me. Do you try to be on your best behavior inside the ropes that week because everybody's looking at you? No, nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> no, can't. It can't. I with the you. Spanish media. I remember being in uh, Paris in 2018, and I remember after you beat Tiger, which I want to get into. I mean, the media, which is a massive scrum, the Spanish media. I mean, they were like emotional. They were like crying because you beat Tiger. It meant so much to them. <laughs> they <laughs> they were, care about it. They care about it. That's a thing. They really care and. It's not like in the U.S. where you have 20 to 30, a lot of big stars. Right. I mean. You're their guy. You had Sevi, then Ollie. From Ollie to Sergio, there was a bit of a gap. Mm -hmm. Like you have Miguel and Alvaro Quiroz and some great names, but not major champions. And then from Sergio, you've had names, but now you have me. Like it's not like we have a bucket to choose from. Like it's that's it. And you rarely get to see them together. You get to see Ollie and, and Sevi and then me and Sergio a little bit, but that's it. So that's why when you do things like that, and Tiger was a heartbreak for Spanish golf for a long time. So to be able to beat him that way, get my first Ryder Cup point like that, I think was not only emotional for me, but for them as well, because they get it. How how big was that day for you? How pumped were you when you knew that? that was <laughs> Probably the biggest overreaction to a four-footer you ever see. <laughs> 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 and mainly because it, it wasn't only that, it's the fact that I'd actually have been playing bad. And when they tell me, you know, here's the T shit tomorrow, you're playing Tiger. I'm complete panic. I'm like, Can we cuss here? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh yeah. Okay, sorry. First instinct, I'm like, holy fuck. It's just one <laughs> Lake. I'm going against the one guy who has more supporters than me in Europe. And it's his type of golf course, right? Target, do this, do that. And I was hitting it bad, so I'm just in complete panic. Like I talked to my mental coach for a while, not Brett, because I have somebody else from Spain for that trying to get my mind right, uh, my physio, trying to get the things that were bugging me right. And I uh, actually talked to Tommy Fleetwood and Thomas Bjorn a little bit about what it is to play against Tiger. Because Thomas Bjorn has played with Tiger a lot in practice runs, so he knew him well. And basically ended up with, I'm going to go out there and pretend he doesn't exist. That was the only way I could make it. It was the first time ever playing with Tiger too. I'd never spoken to him until then. And uh Yeah. And then I come out and play it and kind of play pretty much a flawless round until I missed that putt on 16. But again, that's the best story. <laughs> I missed that putt on 16 and Justin Rose had lost and he's trying to talk to me like him and, and Thomas Bjorn. Like I'm one, I'm going to two holes. Like I'll take that. Oh yeah. Right. Two long holes where I have the advantage. 
And they're trying to cheer me up. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Leave me alone. Like, I just three-putted from 20 feet. Leave me alone. I'm okay. <laughs> and I follow by hitting a 370 down the center, having to gobble it to four feet. I win the match, right? But, like, Thomas Bjorn is trying to – I don't think there's <laughs> images of this, but I'm kind of like, just just, just let me go. <laughs> I just more to like, just – <laughs> get off me. Find this get off I said me. 21 20, was it 23 I don't know whatever it was but I was just like yeah, just get up just get leave on. me let me be like, I'm good <laughs> obviously pissed as can be like, like yeah and, and Rosie was trying to talk to me too right I'm like dude like, I got this go yeah right go and uh, I think one of the coolest memories I have on the golf course besides with the green was the second shot when I hit that shot and I didn't realize the crowd people go nuts and the memory I have is no no sound. And I turn around to look at my caddy, and I see Rory Rosie and somebody else walking, and Rory losing his freaking nuts off, like just. <laughs> and Rosie doing the same thing. That's the cool thing you don't get to see usually, but he's going crazy behind me. And I'm like, man, this is so. I still get goosebumps. And then on 18, I get that putt to, to win, which I don't know if people caught it in Spanish. Uh, I might get emotional about this. My grandpa had just passed away that August. He was my biggest fan and really wanted to be in the Ryder Cup. And right before I hit the putt, somebody said, do it for Seve, who obviously is up in heaven. Made me think of my grandpa as well. And I'm like, hey, man, when I take back, because my routine, I take back a step before I set in to line up the putt. And I'm like, somebody says that. And I'm like, oh, shit. You have to say that right now. Like, this is not a big enough moment. And then uh, it was a weird, like, Seve so being the Ryder Cup hero, my grandpa watching, I'm like, I got this sense of calmness of, oh, this is going in. There's no way this isn't going in. And uh, I went to it, obviously nervous, but confident, and, and made the putt. And that's why the reaction, not only beating Tiger Woods, but it was more for my grandpa and Seve. That's why I go freaking nuts for a four-footer that was right edge uphill. <laughs> like, it was, I shouldn't have that reaction, but it was more just because of what I was feeling at the moment. Uh, it just came out. I think it was a lot of it, obviously, more for, for my grandpa than that. But oh, I get my first point like that. Sorry to your head. When people said that, you know, when that guy say that. And it was cool because then you fast forward to the last Spanish Open. But I had that five, six footer on 18 to to make the birdie and tie Seve's regular with three Spanish Open. As soon as I hit it, somebody yells, Viva Seve. And then it goes in that center. So I was like, you know. It's uh, some moments like that that make it so cool. That's yeah. why I go to the Spanish Open. Of course, I don't, don't get that. I won't get that feeling like that anywhere else, but there, and that's why it's special. I don't know how. I mean, it speaks to how wow. you're at the at the top, at the elite of the elite, that you could have that perspective of that moment that you could understand. And obviously, somebody you know yelling that out probably sparks it. But understand, the <laughs> I context. cursed him at first. I'm like, and, man, don't do that to me right <laughs> now. Then Come to on. hone it in and focus and pour it in. That's, I mean, that's next level. I, like these guys said, I, I'm the biggest tiger guy in the world, and I got the goosebumps feeling about that. Yeah, so. I am too. I mean, I'm right. a huge tiger fan. Yeah. Did you guys speak at all during that match? No. Yeah. He dropped the tea once, and I said, "Hey, tiger, here's your tea." So I go, oh, "Thank you." I think that was it. <laughs> that's how it should be. He doesn't speak. Like, and then I'm, I'm not, like I said, I was trying to act like he didn't exist. Right. But of course, he made that eagle on me on nine. I was like, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Fuck. Here he comes. Here he comes. That's so cool. That's Luckily, really cool. it was a bit more of uh, later in his career, Tiger, right? Like winning East Lake, I think, took a lot out of him. Yeah, that was the week before. So he was clearly tired. I mean, obviously, all of us are tired, but you could tell he wasn't uh, at his best. But I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's, nobody's going to win that. They're just going to remember that you beat Tiger Woods. I, I will. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, look, I think that's an amazing way to, yeah. to wrap things up. I think that's about as good as it gets. I love that you've been, you know, you've been out doing media more. Feels like the last few months, last year or so. Um, not really. I mean, I've been doing pretty much the same thing. It's just. Well, now you're doing it with us. So I've played cool. a little bit more golf, better golf. And that's why I think since the U.S. Open, a lot of it. It's almost like I won a major and now I have credibility. Yeah. Is there, you feel any pressure? I mean, I know you mentioned obviously the other Spanish guys that you feel any kind of pressure to get your masters. <laughs> Honestly, since I won the U S open and being the first Spanish guy, I feel like it'd be really freaking cool. Yeah. If I were to win the PGA and be the one or the other, win the other two and complete the Spanish grand slam, I'm not going to be picky, obviously. Right. <laughs> I would love to win the masters. Uh, I would absolutely love it, but I think this is a little something special, right, of being the one 
to win the other two. Yeah. Definitely. It's so cool to me how much that, cause I think that gets lost a lot. Uh, cause we just see names on a leaderboard and you went to college here and you live here. How much the Spanish roots, you oh, know, yeah. truly, truly mean to you as a person. Well, I think important. that's really cool. It's important. People where I come from in Spain, the Basque country, we have a very profound sense of who we are, a lot of tradition and history. So it's, um, uh, even though silly uh, nationalism is really big there about being Basque. Um, so it's really, really important for us for our, uh, to, you know, have, uh, have our roots be part of us and, and remember that always well. And same, I like to be thankful for the past. I love history, and that's why a lot of this, I speak about it a lot so much, and that's why it matters in that sense. Just What's because. your football club there too? Aren't they one of the founding members of La Liga? I Athletic. Think? Athletic Club. Yeah, no. they're the second oldest club in in Spain, one of the only three to never get relegation with Madrid and Barcelona. The only three. Nah. Knock on everything. <laughs> yeah, knock, on, <laughs> knock on all the wood you could possibly find. Yeah, so oh. yeah, it's uh, that's more. They're almost like a religion over there. I mean, it's it's very high, high, very important for all of us. Well, John Ryan, I, you know, we got a, a lot of people that listen to this that tune into golf week in and week out, and it's really, really cool. I think for them to get an inside look at somebody mm-hmm. as big a name as you. So. Uh, we're big fans of yours. It, it's really cool how much you mean to uh, the the you know the fans in Spain, and you're huge for the golf community around Thank this you. country too. So um, so keep doing what you're doing, and we really appreciate the time. Thank you. My pleasure. You know, uh, hopefully I keep doing good things, and you guys won't be back. I must say. It's okay. You guys can make fun of me. Part of your job. <laughs> oh, no, we're all right. Yeah, well, you know, just don't get mean. Yeah, don't get we're mean. Not, we'll we'll never be malicious. Don't get personal. Hey, I understand. I, did, I, I make fun of myself. I'll be the first one to make fun of myself. We could have gone down an hour and a half of me making fun of myself. <laughs> all the time. stupid things I've done in, in many times. If so. there's anything that this show has done, it's given us perspective. We started as a bunch of just idiots. We're still idiots, but you know, we had we we knew nothing. We never, we we never met Big anybody time. in the golf world. So it's all just opinion based. And then all of a sudden we start meeting guys, realizing yeah. who they actually are. It changes your perspective. If you've listened to this show from day one, seven years ago, however long it's been till now, I mean, we've, been, we've gotten so much more perspective meeting Brett. I've learned more about you and Billy Horschel than I ever yeah, he's thought. He's telling ever... you about me, Brett. What the hell? No, I'm saying like <laughs> learning more about, like, about how you. good of a person you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you won't believe how good of a person this guy is. Like you don't see it. Like you're not seeing that. And same with Billy. I used to call Billy like American Psycho because the guy. I thought he was like a he looks kill like somebody. Like, right. Yeah, definitely. He's and so sudden, intense. I love playing with Billy. You meet him and you're like, you won't see shit. a pro cheer for their fellow competitor shots more than Billy Horschel. Yeah, is that right? That's yeah. awesome. He gets so intense. Like first time I play with him, I told my caddy, I'm like, is he for real? Like, yeah, yeah, no, he really thinks it's a good shot. I'm like, I think he's making fun of me. (laughs) (laughs) No, he's a good guy. Actually, about Billy Horschel, Max Holman was telling me because they played together in the President's (laughs) Cup and Max was telling me on Monday that, you know how when you're playing in a match uh, with somebody and they hit a bad shot, you know, you yell four a little bit like obnoxiously when they hit one off to the side to be like, Oh my God, it's such a bad part. And he's like, Billy was doing it to the point where it was so noticeable that it was embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so like the international guys would hit what he'd be like, four. Be like, no, well, he, it's like going to miss by a yard. No, right? that's just, that's just, that's just, he's just intense. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I remember when that image of him and Poulter talking in, in the putting green, yep. they're like, oh, I wonder what I'm like, Billy could be talking about cupcakes <laughs> <laughs> and he looks that intense. Right. So don't, I mean, that picture means nothing to me. <laughs> yeah. No, we love him. Um, yeah, we're big fans. We appreciate this. Yeah, appreciate thanks. No, thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Thank for you coming. Guys. Appreciate you.